how do you become an astronaut? It turns out there isn't a straight line from here to outer space. But the good news is it doesn't matter much where you start. What does matter is your desire to be exceptional at what you do. And what you do needs to be in line with the needs of the space program. For example, you may apply to study engineering at MIT, an education you can't afford. But thanks to a ROTC program, you can go to school, get your education, and then join the Navy. Then let's say you become a naval diver, where your days are spent in an artificial breathing environment working on the hulls of ships. Then one day you learn that NASA needs dedicated people who can function comfortably in a spacesuit fixing the International Space Station. And before you know it, you're one of 12 who gets hired. We invited NASA astronaut Captain Heidi Marie Stephanishan Piper to join us for a conversation that matters about what going to space is like and why she wants her career in space to inspire young women to achieve their dreams. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. I am a little awestruck by you because you have done something that from the moment that I uh, was transfixed by the first uh, space shuttle launch, I thought, oh my gosh, that is something that I would just love to do. I remember uh, listening as they were doing the final countdown to the first launch, and I think it was Robert Crippen who was the, uh, uh, the commander of the space shuttle, and his heart rate was sitting around 62, 63 beats a minute. And I'm thinking, how do you do that? What was that moment like? So the moment of my first shuttle launch, um, the, first, the, the only thought that was going through my head was just light the rockets, I wanna go. Yeah. And the reason I say that is because my first flight, STS-115, was scheduled, um, originally scheduled for May of 2003. Um, first of February 2003 was the Columbia accident. Yes. And, uh, and so that put everything on hold. For a year and a half, wasn't uh, it? Or actually, it was two and a half years. Two and a half years. Before we flew the next shuttle. Wow. Um, that was the one that was scheduled before us. And in the interim, um, because of the, uh, the, the shuttles being shut down, that uh, they had added another logistics flight um, in front of ours. Um, and so that flight went a year later. Um, and the reason there was another delay of a year is because NASA still hadn't solved the, uh, the foam shedding problems. And mm -hmm. So they delayed things for, for about a year until um, they got that, uh, that under control. And then we were finally scheduled, um, initially we were scheduled for late August of uh, 2006. Um, the day before our launch date, there was a bad thunderstorm at the Cape. Mm. Lightning hit the pad. Oh my gosh. I mean, there's, there was a, one of the security cameras at, at the Kennedy Space Center actually filmed it. So I've, you know, so I've got this little video clip <laughs> and you see a lightning bolt um, hit, and it hit the lightning rod um, that the pad has. So the pad has a lightning dissipation system. It did what it was supposed to do, but they said, okay, let's, let's uh, delay the launch uh, for two days so we could check out all the systems. So well, they, yeah, and rightly so. And, and so rightfully in, so. In that so. moment, you weren't having those like, <laughs> Did I make the right decision moments? Oh, no, 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 no at that point. I knew it was the, the right decision. But uh, so that was the first of a number of delays. Um, then we had a small motor um, that runs on three phases. One of the three phases failed. Um, a lot of motors that are three-phase motors can run on two. They went through the analysis. They said, okay, it'll be fine. Um, and so that, okay, that one was another day delay. Then we had a hurricane in the Gulf. Oh, my gosh. And even though the hurricane was... Um, far enough away, um, what NASA likes to do for their, or not that they like to do, but what they do for all their launches is that they protect a five-day window for a launch mm -hmm. so that you could have multiple launch attempts. Um, and on the very last day of that launch window, there was a potential for high winds. And uh, so they, they were really looking at that hard and they made the decision. They said, well, we're not sure um, if we're going to exceed the winds on that last day, so, so as a precaution, let's start rolling the orbiter back. And uh, they did. And so they sent us back to Houston. And then we had, by the time I got home, they said, nope. They looked at the, uh, the storm. The storm took a major turn in an opposite direction. It's no impact. 
Um, they're turning the vehicle back and we're gonna launch next week. So by the time that so, you're sitting there. And so then, <laughs> you know, a couple days later, we came back to, the, back to uh, Florida, got back into the launch count, then they had some sensor problems that had been a long ongoing problem. So we were on the very, very last day of our launch window, so that if we hadn't launched on the day that we did, then it would have been probably two to three months um, until, because um, there was a Soyuz coming up, um, and so, so they had to, we had to be off, and it would have been much, much later. Um, so by that point, that's why <laughs> on launch day, it was the last day of the window, and I said, you know what, we've been waiting for, th I've been waiting for three and a half years. Let's just light this rocket and go. <laughs> Let's light her up. Yep. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you to hang on for a second while I take a quick commercial break. Okay. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. What's the ride like? Uh, like from the moment that you feel that uh, initial ignition, because there's a second or two before there's a little bit of a lift off, and then it goes, right? Right, because you know? the, um, the main engines light six seconds before lift off. Yeah. And so you do feel the vibration of, you know, the, the, the exhaust coming out, and so yeah. there is a little bit of rumbling. Um, actually, the first thing you feel is, um, a little bit earlier in the countdown, um, what they do is they, they move the gimbals on the, on the uh, rockets and on the main engines. Yep. And so when they do that, mm -hmm. the, the whole shuttle sways a little bit. So you feel that, so you, yeah. and, and you hear that, you know, we, we're on the same, you know, we're tied into the comm loop, so we hear everything that's going on in the launch control center, we hear the countdown, we hear, you know, all the, you know, T minus this clock, mm -hmm. T minus that clock. And, and so we hear that all, um, so you know it's getting close. Um, yeah, six seconds before the main engine's light, and, uh, and so at that point you know that, okay. Um, we're going. We're going. Yeah. That, not a guarantee. There was one shuttle mission that the main engine's lit, and two seconds later the computers detected something and shut down. Oh. So it could, but the time you are going is at the, at the uh, solid rocket booster light. Um, because at that point you are going and at that point it is just um, you just get this you know we all refer to it as a, as a kick in the pants yeah because you feel this acceleration but, and but are you you must be experiencing as you get going extraordinary g-forces now the maximum g's you get is three g's that's it that's it yeah oh I've experienced more than that yeah you probably most people experience more on a roller coaster Oh, you do. really? Yeah. So it's a relatively smooth ride then? Yes, but unlike a roller coaster, um, you, you get those, the whole liftoff is about, is about eight and a half minutes. Right. And your maximum G's are actually right at the end. As you exit and the atmosphere? No, it's, it's as the vehicle is accelerating and it's just due to the force of accelerations because you're just, you're just speeding up so much. Yeah. And so the, um, the this, the uh, engines were designed to throttle down so it, you don't get more than three G's. Um, initially, yeah, you f you feel that that lift off, but you, it's it's just a, it's just you know a little bit more than two G's, huh. um, and you don't get that maximum G's until the very end. And I'm it's sure only you three. can't help but go, okay, there go the solid rocket boosters. Yes, you oh, do. Good, they're gone. <laughs> yeah, you do know they're gone. That's yeah. the first. That's the first two minutes. Yep. And after they're gone, it does get a much quieter ride. Mm -hmm. um, not as much vibration, and um, and not as much noise either. You have a tremendous space walking or EVA record. Um, uh, you were out. You were outside of the International Space Station quite a bit when you when you were on your missions. Yes, I uh, made a total of five spacewalks. Two on the first mission and then three on the second mission. And how long are you out of the uh, the space station when you're doing those walks? So each one of my walks were right around six and a half hours. Six and a half hours? Yes. Holy smokes. And that's from the time, you know, you open the hatch to close the hatch. In looking at your career, you were a naval diver. Yes. And, and, and I, I listened to something that you talked about saying, okay, well, you know, here I am, uh, you know, a girl growing up in the Midwest, I become a diver, and I kind of start thinking about the space program, but I'm not a pilot, and yet you made it to the space program. 
What was it that, that compelled you to go there, and then what did you have to do to make that happen? Because I'm sure that there's a whole bunch of young women who will watch this interview over the years saying, okay, I want to do what you did, but how did you do it? First thing mm -hmm. that NASA looks at um, when they select astronauts is what is your education? Where's your background? You have to go to college. And the minimum requirement is you have to get at least a bachelor's degree, um, which is a four-year degree, in a technical field. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. And did you take those courses knowing that it would put you in line for potential qualification to enter the space program? Uh, no. Um, oh. I, I, res I got my degree in mechanical engineering and I selected engineering because when I was in high school and I was trying to figure out um, what was I going to go study in, in, in college, what was I going to get my degree in, um, you know, I looked and said, okay, what are my best subjects um, that I'm studying right now? And my best subjects were either languages or math. So you go study yeah. mechanical engineering. I, I don't see the direct line to, to uh, underwater, uh, an underwater career with the U.S. Navy. What, how'd that, you know, play itself out? So I got into the Navy as a way to pay for college. Mm. Because although my parents, um, they wanted um, all of us children, I have four brothers, so they wanted me and my brothers to, to have the opportunity, um, you know, to go to college. But I think they anticipated us, you know, going to the University of Minnesota, which is a very good school. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it, we would have been, you know, in-state tuition, living at home. Um, and so I went ahead and I applied to MIT. Oh, easy school to easy get school into. Easy school to get into, yeah. you know. <laughs> And I thought, you know what, okay, I got, you know, I got good test scores, I got good grades, I'll apply and see what happens. And I got accepted. And so I said, okay, if MIT accepts me, that's where I'm gonna go to college. And my parents said, okay. And I looked at the tuition bill and I said, okay. I kinda know how much my money my parents had and I would have probably depleted all that money and I don't know if it would have taken me through all four years of school. Wow. And uh, so I said, okay, what other options are out there? Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother, my older brother actually suggested to me that I look at the military. And uh, so I, you know, MIT had an ROTC unit from all the services. And so I looked at all the different services and I settled in on the Navy just because I said, well, the Navy seems to have more options. Um, you know, you can go ships, do this, do that. And, and they even had aviation. Yes, they do. And yeah. I thought, okay, you know. Yeah. Always been fascinated with flying growing up. And I remember when I was nine years old, um, it was just my older brother and I, he was 10, I was nine. Uh, we went to Germany for the summer. And so I remember sitting in, in the airport in Chicago and waiting for our connection and just watching airplanes take off and land. And I thought, wow, that, that'd be really cool to do that someday. Mm -hmm. um, but from the time I was nine, I never really put you know, two and two together and how do you could become a pilot. So I just kind of put that on the back burner. And then when I looked into the Navy, I was like, oh, okay, I can go to Naval Flight School. But you didn't. And I didn't because uh, right before graduation and commissioning, um, I found out that I failed the eye test to become a pilot. And so at the time I met my, my husband um, and he was going off to Navy dive school after graduation. And so I said- Perfect motivation. I yes. said, okay, yeah. I can, you know, I grew up in Minnesota, I can swim. So off I went to Navy dive school and became a Navy diver and, and uh, spent my career doing ship repair. So you're under, operating under some pretty massive uh, ships and so you get used yeah. to uh, operating or carrying out your duties in an artificial environment because yeah. you need breathing apparatus. Did that perfectly attune you for the role that you wound up taking on when you joined the space program? Um, I think it did. Yeah. Um, I think that was probably one thing that stood out in my application when I went ahead and applied to the NASA program. And, uh, you know, so at the time I applied is when NASA was getting ready to build the space station. And since they knew that a lot of the construction was going to be done by doing spacewalks, um, and there's really no job on the Earth that will tell NASA that, yeah, this person's going to be a good spacewalker, this person won't be a good spacewalker. When you uh, are in space and you're looking back on the Earth, 
What does it tell you about uh, this place that we call home? It means that we really need to take care of this planet. We really that we do, have. don't we? We really do. We really do. Because even if we do find a suitable home um, somewhere else out there, um, just the fact of getting us there mm -hmm. is an enormous effort. Even yeah, just into... Into just low Earth low orbit. Just yeah. put us in an orbit around the Earth. Mm -hmm. That takes a lot of effort. Um, and then now if you want to go beyond mm -hmm. um, low Earth orbit, um, then that's going to take significantly more and right now, first off, we don't even know where to go. Second off, we can't get there. Third and final break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Well, yeah, because and I think uh, Kepler B or something like that is the closest exoplanet that's been identified mm -hmm. through the through the Hubble space or mm -hmm. uh, telescope, um, and it's only 4.5 light years away. I started to do some calculations. Well, it would take us about 80,000 years or something. Yeah, to we'll, get never, there. No, we'll, we'll never, we'll never make it. We'll never make that. Yeah, because um, you know, so because you know, warp drive and travel mm. at the speed of sound mm. is something that you only see in the movies. It's not physically it, possible. No. Um, and so, so something that's you know four light years away, that's that's as far as light travels, and we don't we can't travel that fast. Okay, so that raises so, the question: Why are we going to space? Like, what is it that we uh, gain from the knowledge that we glean from our ventures into space, the International Space Station? We went to the moon. We're now. I mean, there was just the landing on Mars yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, why are we doing this? What what is the benefit to us as a species? So, so there's a lot of reasons um, for going into space. Um, you know, there's the there's just the pure, you know, exploration. You know, do it because it's there, and we can do it. Um, I think that's something that um, us as humans, um, we always have had that desire to go explore, and 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 just to go explore, learn, find new new places to go. And you know what? If if it takes a little bit of effort to get someplace where well, we'll figure out how to do it because we can. Mm -hmm. But while we're doing it, there's an awful lot that we learn about our planet um, from, you know, what created our planet, how did it, how did it come to be? And from knowing that, um, then that will help us understand what it is we need to do now to help take care of our planet. Right, I think um, that it arms us with information about uh, what's coming. I, yes. I was just reading an interesting article put out by NASA this morning, and it was about the fourth or fifth time that I've read this about uh, the coming maunder minimum on the sun, which is a reduction in, in sunspot activity. Well, if we didn't have you know, the solar observation uh, satellite that's mm -hmm. in space right now, we wouldn't yeah. be able to see what's happening and what the potential impact might be on Earth. Then you can take it even one, one, other, one other step further as you look at all of the other things that have come out of the space program that were not necessarily designed for space. Some of them were. Um, you, know, we have, you know, we have detection equipment that we put on the Hubble telescope that we've been able to use that same technology for detecting breast cancer on, on, in hospitals. Huh. You know, so so yeah. we, we, do, we, we take things in the space program and we adapt them for our life here on Earth, and it makes the things better for everybody here on Earth. Um, and then you also, you know, we, part of the reason why we wanted to build the space station was to have a science platform um, in orbit, because once you get out of, you know, the influence of Earth's gravity and you get into a microgravity environment, um, there's a lot that we have learned about, um, you know, things whether it's, um, you know, biology. Um, Crystal growth, um, you know, fire, you know, combustion. Um, we've we have facilities up on the space station to do research that we could never do here on the ground, and we've learned just a lot. Just because of things, gravity. Just yeah. because of gravity. Yeah. And and we've learned so much by having the space station up there. What's it like being in the company of so many extraordinary people who are driven to make a difference? That is one of the things that. I noticed very quickly about the space program um, is first off, there's a lot of really, really smart people that that you know the the, the people that that you know do everything from designing the you know the spacecrafts that we fly, designing the equipment that we use, 
um, you know, designing, you know, writing the software to, you know, do the calculations um, and everything, you know, that, once I see what they have done, I can understand that, but I don't think that I could ever come to that conclusion that they did. So there's a lot of people out there. But then the other part of it is also the people on the ground that do the day-to-day -day work to sustain us in space. Um, you know, people always would, you know, sometimes I think they were joking when they said, so how does it feel to get on a, you know, government vehicle that was built by the lowest bidder? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. you know, so yeah, we take the lowest, lowest cost because, you know, we need to be good stewards of, of taxpayers' money. But um, it never really bothered me that I was, I ever, ever had any concern about it because of the people that I met that were in the space program because they all wanted to be there and be part of it so that they can say at the end of the day, yes, I helped pe pe put people into space. It seems like an opportunity, I'm sure, for many that, that appears to be out of reach. But what's your message to young people and especially young women who were trying to encourage to get into the sciences and engineering and so on about if you want to do this? So, so my advice is if you want to do this, um, the first thing you have to do is you do have to, you know, you do have to study math and science. Um, and you know what, math, you know, I know when I talk to high school students, half of them, probably more than half of them tend to roll, roll their eyes at me when I talk about math. And I said, you know what, yes, maybe there are gonna be times that you're gonna think this math is really hard and it's really boring and you don't like it. But you have to, you have to be able to understand it so that you can go on and, you know, do the fun stuff in engineering um, that you need the math for. So that's why math is so important. Um, and once you do that, um, then you're going to, you know, you got to go to, you got to go to college. That's that's, you know, the way it is right now. You have to go to college and probably spend a little bit more than just your your basic four years. But once you do that. Uh, you know, you've got to go out and find what is your passion in life. Um, and if you, you find your passion, and always remember, okay, look at what NASA's, what NASA's doing. And if you stay in step with what NASA's doing, and you have a skill that's going to make you a good astronaut, you've got to be really good at it, because the last time NASA selected astronauts, they had 18,000 applications. They picked 12. Wow. So, so that's why you, you really have to be passionate about what you're doing and you have to be really good at it. But if you do that, um, chances are, you know, you may get lucky and get selected to be an astronaut because you may have that one skill that NASA needs. Such and as you had. Such as I had. And if not, you know what, if, even if I had never become an astronaut, I actually liked what I was doing in the Navy. Um, I mean, I liked it so much I went back after I was done <laughs> playing with becoming an astronaut. But, so even if you don't become an astronaut, you've now set yourself up for a wonderful career that will make you successful in life. And a fantastic journey through life. Thank you very much for coming in and sharing your experience It's a pleasure, with us. thank you.